New evidence surfaces in stabbing death of a 15-year-old boy. Ghana gets CDB funding for new Parika Stelling with Smart Bridge. And man who attempted to choke five-year-old to death to make court appearance. These and more right now on our Tuesday, July 31st edition of MTV's News Update. I'm Sandy Ramotar. Good evening to our viewers in Guyana and online. We begin tonight's broadcast by telling you that a new stelling will soon be constructed at Parika East Bank in Siquibo as the Caribbean Development Bank has approved close to $1 billion line of credit for several infrastructure projects here. Here is more. The Board of Directors of the Caribbean Development Bank said that U.S. $4.4 million, or approximately $880 million Guyana dollars, will finance feasibility studies and designs for the upgrade of the Lethem Aerodrome, construction of a new bridge at Wisma, and a new riverine transport terminal at Parika. Chief of the CDB's Economic Infrastructure Division, O'Reilly Lewis, said in a statement that a proposed enhancements to the transport transportation sector in Guyana will cover road, air and river transport, providing opportunities for business development and enhanced employment. The CDC added that the selected sites are all considered to be priority areas for improvements by the government. The Mackenzie Wisma Bridge was constructed 51 years ago and includes just one lane. On average, approximately 3,000 vehicles cross the bridge daily, which results in traffic congestion. It is a major connection point between Georgetown and Demerara, as well as to several interior locations and Brazil. Upgrading the Letem Aerodrome is expected to capitalize on current and future demands for travel between northern Brazil, the Caribbean, Latin South America, and North America. It is also expected to facilitate the development and expansion of businesses and other economic activities in the Region 9 area. Meanwhile, the Parika Riverine transport terminal is the main hub for riverine transportation services between Parika and the neighboring communities separated by the Essequibo River. It has deteriorated over time and is becoming a threat to public safety. The project to be implemented through the Ministry of Public Infrastructure will complement other CDB interventions including ongoing work to improve sections of the road link from Linden to Letham. The project is consistent with CDB's strategic objective of supporting inclusive and sustainable growth and development within its borrowing member countries as well as its corporate priorities of strengthening and modernizing social and economic infrastructure and promoting environmental sustainability. Reporting for MTV News Update, Lashona Gomes, Cornelius. This is MTV's News Update. More news on the other side of the break. Stay with us. A 17-year-old East Coast Tamara Lebra is the country's latest road fatality after he was struck down by a minibus on the Good Faith Maikoni Public Road, East Coast Tamara. That is pedal cyclist Ricardo James of Recess Village, Maikoni. Police say about 2015 hours yesterday, minibus BTT 5273, driven by a 59-year-old resident of La Reasonable East Coast Demerara, when James reportedly swerved into the part of the vehicle. He was picked up in an unconscious state and rushed to the Maikoni Cottage Hospital, where he was pronounced dead on arrival. The driver who passed the breathalyzer test is in police custody, assisting with investigation. Chelsea Griffith now reports that almost three weeks after the stabbing death of a 15-year-old boy at a wedding house, new information has surfaced implicating a policing group member. More in this report. On July 8, Ricardo Singh, 15, was stabbed in his abdomen during a fight at a wedding house at Sue's Dyke, East Bank, Demerara. He died before receiving medical attention, while several persons, including a community policing group member, were arrested and subsequently released. No one was charged with the teen's killing. However, videos have now surfaced implicating the CPG member who was initially arrested. The dead teen's father, Satro Singh, armed with the video evidence, told this newscast his son was brutally murdered since the accounts of the incident are not adding up. 
there's there's what there's where um, my company you know to to, to call in the higher authority even um home affairs minister or any any anybody in the higher authority to look into the city because it's, this is not something and and I'm a person should go through it's not easy it's not easy to lose a kid like that but this was brutal this is cold blood and water and nobody been hold for this. Because um, I don't want to wait this person caught up the week. My whole truth now. Something my wife can't sleep. You know? What happened to me here? I don't want this hunt to any innocent person, you know? Look at the kid, 16 years, 15 years, gone on the journey. You know? Root, it was a brutal something. The force was outside, the guy bar was poked up, beat black and blue, you know, but I was sick about the other, about the, uh, the market. He believes that the young man who murdered his son was the man who jumped in the back of the community policing group van with him and was also the last person to see his son. He added that his son's body had marks of violence when he saw him. He is calling on the Criminal Investigations Department of the Guyana Police Force to conduct a thorough probe into the death of his son. Well, the, the blood and everything, well, they pick him up, they say after when they come back, they pick up the body and then the blood in the, in the, in the back of the vehicle. Wherever, wherever they got um, Now, you know, you know, you come down, they didn't stop at the hospital to pronounce it. They was straight to the, like, if you can't tell and I stopped, I stopped stop at Diamond, um, Diamond Hospital, the, the security guard said they didn't know anything about anybody drop off there or check in. So mm -hmm. there's when there's when we drove down to like in and there's how I go see my son die. Well, um, well there's the there's the part where we where we try to get out of here now um can't can't have the baby now showing blood in the van. And there's why there's why we try to get that now. There's just that the blood in the van we come back there. There was no there's there's where um that we go in and to now studying how the blood will reach in the van. The same pick up come back with blood. How come, how come the blood went in there? The elder Singh said that the CPG member who was driving the van which transported his son is a witness to the crime. But so far, police have not yet questioned him regarding the incident. Chelsea Griffith reporting for MTV's News Update. Police are probing the suspected drowning of an engineer whose body was fished out of the Demora River at Supply East Bank Demora earlier today. That is Neil Sokram, 34 of Kane Street, Medibank, Georgetown. A police report said that the incident occurred sometime over the last 24 hours at JSB Investments Stone Yard and Wharf at Dog R. Sue's Dyke Public Road. Inquiries disclosed that the victim was last seen alive just after midnight, entering the boat he works on, apparently under the influence of alcohol. According to his colleague Marcini Grosvinner, a sailor of the victim, who appeared to be under the influence of alcohol, came on board of the vessel and invited him out for drinks, an invitation he refused. Sokram reportedly left the vessel and was not seen until around 12 hours today when his body was fished out of the river. Investigations are continuing. Three years into the 11th Parliament, the Opposition People's Progressive Party won its first vote in the House after two ministers of the governing APNU AFC abstained and another absented himself from the vote. Here's that story. The motion was brought to the House by Minister of Social Cohesion, George Norton, on behalf of the Committee of Appointments to grant two employees of the Financial Intelligence Unit duty-free concessions for vehicles at 2,000 cylinder capacity. Be it resolved that this National Assembly adopts the motion of the Standing Committee on Appointments to address matters relating to the cylinder capacity for duty-free concessions to be granted to the accountant and the attorney at law of the Financial Intelligence Unit. Opposition front bencher A. Finale argued that the motion was improper and should not have been brought to the House in the first place. Coming with a motion to address this issue, in my view, and the view of us on this side of the house is not and should not be the approach. If we want to address the issues of benefits to employees of the FIU, that should have been addressed in the law itself. 
When a vote was called, the motion was defeated 28 to 26 after Minister of Public Security Kemra Dramjatan and Minister of Business Dominic Gaskin chose to break ranks and abstain, while Minister of Finance Winston Jordan absented himself by leaving the chambers before the vote was called. The motion in question would have granted a newly appointed accountant and authority at law of the FYU duty-free concessions. The FIU is an agency that acts under the anti-money laundering and countering the financing of terrorism laws. Border market vendors are calling for better security measures in place as they continue to be victims of break-ins as well as personal items being snatched by bandits. Upon a visit to the border market earlier today, News Update spoke with several vendors about the security measures in place at the market. According to most of the vendors, despite the presence of city constables in the markets during the day, persons are still being robbed of their valuables. The vendors also argue in addition to customers being robbed during the broad daylight, market stalls are being broken into during the nights. Truthfully, the marketing and no security because the market is like an ICT front in the market. I got a stall outside the market. You, the market is locked up and the stars are still breaking. How do you stand them still breaking? Constable them, they're right to wrong and people getting robbed and they ain't got no time. It's really civilian, they catch most of the thief. See what them is there for? All them is there for Wi Fi. Thief in the Wi Fi all the time. Be Wi Fi all the time. They don't got time, but when they're done, they cock up right there by them, stand and sleep. People getting robbed in the market daily. Yes, they man chain and snatch. I think it was Friday or Thursday, a lady band got snatched there. It's not good. You gotta be scared. It's well, we stand to get robbed. Maybe it's actually everything to the clear out to the stand. No, we never get nobody. They never find. In addition to inadequate security measures, most of the vendors we spoke with also complain of the deplorable conditions under which they work. Yes, I got to look at the issue because of road selling. People don't have washroom out there for nobody go in the night, and people be here out there whole night. So what they do, they run, come in the market, do what they have to do and go on. It's a dry weather market. When rain fall, we can't put out our stuff. So we would need someone to look into it for us. Because you can see right now, it's all of our stuff. We had to move because of the rain. And at the end of the month, we got to pay them our rent. Only recently, Chief City Constable Andrew Thu announced that the city authority will soon be ramping up security at all major markets in the city. Thu was at the time addressing reporters during the aftermath of the break-in and robbery of the L.C. Persaud Mirage jewelry store at Starbuck Market, where millions of dollars worth in gold and diamond jewelry were stolen. Reporting for MTV News Update, Lashona Gomes, Cornelius. Still to come after the break, a man who attempted to choke five-year-old to death makes court appearance. Stay with us. Welcome back. You're watching MTV's News Update. Farmers in Lethem and its satellite villages are now forced to wait another six months before they can start replanting their crops, which were damaged from the recent flood. Following severe flooding in Lethem and its environs, as a result of the overtopping of the Rio Branco and Rio Negro rivers into the Iring and Takudu rivers, farmers are now left with serious headaches. Vice Chairman of the region, Carl Singh, told this newscast, the inundated lands damaged a myriad of crops. Distributed um, supplies to them, cleaning detergents and so on, for them to um, sanitize their houses and their, their yards and we will send them back. At the moment, we have some supplies from Mastanari and Sanquist. We're just waiting on the, the Rams plane to be operational, and we're going to send in those stuff to them. Six to five families who were housed in shelters have now returned to their homes as water receded in the villages. There is also an ongoing distribution of disaster risk supplies from the Regional Democratic Council and the Civil Defense Commission. Remember, it's, they're using cassava, cassava crop. And once water would have been. Uh, flooded in the farm for a few days, what would happen is the, the, the cassava tubers would rot. So they would have to wait for a next crop. That would be six months a year. 
Gauhati region is over time plagued with floods as it often times experience a six month wet season followed by drought. The parents of Ramesh Khanna, a six year old boy who drowned while at school at Abrams Creek, Pomeroon River last month, are calling on the Director of Public Prosecution to launch an inquest into the incident. The parents who, through their attorney, Anil Nandlal, wrote to DPP today, cited neglect on the part of the five teachers who were present at the school during the incident. According to the letter seen by this newscast, the incident occurred about 11.55 hours on June 12. The parents, Dudnat and Rabika Kanai, stated that at the time, the five teachers were present at the institution while the gate to the school's compound were left open and from all indications, the children were left unattended. The child drowned in the present and sight of several persons, according to the letter. According to Kanais, while the matter is being investigated by the police authority, they have very little confidence the investigations will be fruitful. According to Nandalal, to date neither the Ministry of Education nor Social Protection contacted the parents even to offer their sympathies. The attorney said he will also be filing legal proceedings against the state in due course. The Ghana Hemp Industries is calling on the government of Guyana to use the vacant lands owned by the Ghana Sugar Corporation, Gaisuko, for the cultivation of industrial hemp. The Guyana Hemp Industries, DHI, argue that with a timely and proper cultivation of industrial hemp on a large scale, communities across the country will stand to benefit economically. Chief Executive Officer of the Guyana Hemp Industries, Vraman Bedesi, emphasized that industrial hemp is seen as an economic savior and substitute for vulnerable industries like sugar. The CEO's arguments remain that industrial hemp will breed fresh life into communities whose economies in the past relied mainly on the cultivation of sugarcane. Further, but as he reasoned that it would be groundbreaking if President David Granger were to remove all barriers for the establishment of the industry. It is Badesi's belief that with a swift removal of industrial hemp from Guyana's list of prohibited substances, opportunity for full-scale commercialization within the market will be opened. Also, August 6 is earmarked across all 10 administrative regions as Hemp Lobby Day, where several persons are expected to lobby for hemp to become industrialized in Guyana. The venue for the Region 4 Hemp Lobby Day will be at the lawns of the Young Women Christian Association, which will commence at 9 hours. In some instances, being confused as marijuana, industrial hemp fibers are utilized in large quantities for lightweight construction, in the automotive industry, insulating materials and for thin, tear-resistant papers. Reporting for MTV News Update, Lashona Gomes, Cornelius. As Guyana joins the rest of the British Caribbean to mourn observing the 184th anniversary of the abolition of slavery in the region, a packed calendar of activity is planned for several parts of the country to mark the occasion. Here's that report. The British slave trade officially ended in 1807, making the buying and selling of slaves from Africa illegal. However, slavery itself had not ended. It was not until August 1, 1834, that slavery ended in the British Caribbean following legislation passed the previous year. Former United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon had once described the transatlantic slave trade as one of the greatest atrocities in history. He had reminded that this unparalleled global tragedy claimed untold millions of lives over four centuries and left a terrible legacy that continues to dehumanize and oppress people around the world to this day. For Guyana, the sacrifices and struggles of our four parents have indelibly helped to shape the Guyanese society. It has left Guyana with a rich African culture, include food, dress and dances. But while emancipation has its rich history and as a reminder of the struggles of those who came here forcefully, many Guyanese look forward to the occasion. Emancipation means a lot to me because my ancestors were slave here and they die here by working hard. So I just remember how they were ill-treated and brutalized and different things. So when this time come around, I really celebrate it. Being married to an African and so from being in an interracial marriage. So we plan to take the kids out to the park so they can get to learn about the culture and stuff. Well, tomorrow I can just sit down and relax and uh, re reflect. 
you know, is, is a day for reflection. And, 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 and that's about it for me. You know, family, friends, just sit, relax and reflect. It means to me what I think it should mean generally, not only in race, but in culture and coming together, in loving and sharing and giving to each other. And so it brings, I find it brings the races together. Especially as a black African person, you know, you are now seen as somebody you have a part to play in this universe as we did from the beginning a number of activities are planned across the country to mark the occasion including the annual emancipation day activities at the national park as well as several stories across the country here is rajesh lakon with today's tech wrap Good evening and welcome to this week's edition of Star Technology Wrap. As always, I'm your host Rajesh Lakan along with Yannick Sobers. And this week we'll be continuing with Star Computers back to school deals. Yannick. Okay, uh, thank you Rajesh. Well, this week, we're, as you said, you know, we're continuing with the back to school deals. A lot of persons are looking for, you know, laptops, different things to, you know, head back to school. And at Star Computers, we have great deals, but this time we're taking it up a, a notch, you know. We're giving you uh, the ultimate back-to-school package, that's what we're calling it. And this includes a laptop with a cell phone. So, I mean, you're getting two great items when you purchase, when you come and pick up this package. You're getting an 11-inch laptop, and also you're going to get a nice phone, you know. For, uh, you have students that might feel, you know, like young students. You don't want to give them maybe a smartphone, but you want to give them something to keep in contact with them, you know? So we have a great package here where you're getting an excellent phone. You can stay connected to that part to your child. At the same time, you're giving them something that can enhance their education. So great package here from Star Computers. Okay, well the laptop that we have offering right now, it's the Lenovo IdeaPad. And we're also giving the Hyundai phone along with that and this package is going for just fifty-two thousand dollars. i mean that's a great great price you can't beat that price anywhere i can guarantee you guys that and easy financing also applied to this here yes easy financing is also available on this item here this package in particular it's going for you can get it for up around one thousand and eighty nine dollars which is very very small i mean that's easy and this laptop here, what exactly can it do? Just to type in? Um, well, this laptop, uh, don't don't judge the size, but actually <laughs> this laptop here, it comes with the Microsoft Office on it, so you can actually be able to type your um, documents on this laptop. You can email, you can watch YouTube um, videos, anything that you need to do on this laptop. So it's fully loaded and ready to use for any student out there. And this deal running until school reopens? Yes, this deal is also running in um, coordination with the other uh, laptop deal that we have. So it's until school opens, yes. So you're getting everything there that you need. You get a phone, you get a laptop. Great deal for just $52,000 at uh, Star Computer. Now last week we have touched on another deal with the laptop. But the complete package, I must say. How yes. Is that so um, well, the back to school package, it's been going great. A lot of persons are coming in, but just to clarify some things, you know, we've had persons come in and ask some questions about the deal in particular. Uh -huh. um, what is happening is that you come into Star, we will give you a quotation for the item, uh -huh. and you will be able to go to the bank with your necessary documents. The documents will include basically your proof of address, your pay slip, um, your ID. Um, those kind of information that you would need to basically access the the, um, the loan from the bank. It's a great, great deal right now. Um, it's going for just this period, which is August, and it's very easy, it's very simple. The interest rate, you can't beat this. What I must say is that it's just 12.5%. That's great, very, very low. The payment period is actually one year, so you're getting an entire year to basically pay for this item so that's very easy and as we mentioned earlier it's ninety nine thousand dollars for the entire package so it's really really good right now well, thank you and that's all we have for you in this week's edition of star technology wrap do join us next week wednesday for another edition
man who choked five-year-old until she bleeds from the eyes remanded. Here's Chelsea Griffith with today's score drawn up. A 36-year-old man was charged for wounding his reputed wife and her mother and then stealing a motor vehicle to escape the police. Julian Sargent, 36, appeared before Magistrate Alicia George at the Sparring Dam Magistrate Court and was remanded to prison until August 29 after denying all three charges. It is alleged that the suspect on July 28, 2018 at Success Squatting Area East Coast Demerara unlawfully wounded his reputed wife Tiffany Macbeth and her mother Lorraine Macbeth. He was also charged for being armed with a cutlass and robbing Revenger Singh of a motor vehicle valued at $1.2 million. Shortly after Lorraine Macbeth, 56, Tiffany Macbeth, 18, and her five-year-old niece retired to bed, Tiffany's reputed husband went into a rampage and began choking the toddler and stabbed both women. Sergeant reportedly choked his reputed wife's five-year-old niece, causing the child to bleed from her eyes. After the women raised an alarm, Sergeant turned to the elderly woman and his wife, stabbing them several times before attempting to flee the scene. He was arraigned in the Sparendam Magistrate Court and was remanded to prison until August 29. A 45-year-old man was today charged before Chief Magistrate Anne McLennan after attempting to murder his cousin with a cutlass. Collis Isaacs of Blueberry Hill, Linden, was not required to plead to the indictable charge, which stated that on July 24 at Kumong Kumong Puruni River, he wounded Troy Semple with the intent to commit murder. Isaacs was represented by attorney at law Clyde Ford, who told the court that his client's actions were that of self-defense since Semple attacked him with a cutlass. Police prosecutor Gordon Mansfield made no objection to bail, but requested that conditions be attached if granted. Mansfield noted that Isaacs and Semple are cousins, and on the day they had a misunderstanding, where Semple became annoyed and armed himself with a cutlass and attacked his cousin. However, Isaacs managed to relieve him of the cutlass and dealt a chop to Semple's face. The injured man was rushed to the hospital, where he was later treated and sent away. Isaacs was released on $75,000 bail by the chief magistrate with the condition that he lodge his passport at the court and stay away from the victim. The matter was transferred to the Bartica Magistrate Court until August 16. A 38-year-old construction worker was today remanded to prison by Senior Magistrate Fabio Azor for snatching a woman's gold chain. Godfrey Troy Thompson denied that on July 29 at Mandela Avenue, Georgetown, he stole a gold chain valued at $35,000 from Selena Charles. Police prosecutor Warren Thornhill objected to the accused being released on bail on the grounds that Thompson is the main suspect in a murder investigation ongoing. Thornhill added that if the accused is released on bail, he might very well flee the jurisdictions. Thompson noted that he was charged for murder before, but he appealed the matter in 2011. The magistrate, however, remanded Thompson until August 15. Chelsea Griffith reported for MTV's Court Roundup. Regional and international news and the Ghana Stock Exchange coming up after the break. In the region, nine people have been killed in a gun attack in Northeast Colombia. Armed men and motorcycles arrive at a billiard hall in the village of El Tara in the Norte de Sandador province and opened fire windows inside. The region on the border was Venezuela has been hit by a feud between rival left-wing rebel groups, but right-wing paramilitary groups were also active in the area. Thousands of people have been displaced as a result of the fighting. Monday's incident happened in Cotatumbo, an area with minimal police and armed presence, where groups are vying for control of the key drug routes to Venezuela. The number of dead rose from 8 to 9 after one of the injured died in the hospital. And internationally, Facebook says it has removed 32 accounts and pages believed to have been set up to influence the midterm U.S. elections in November. It said it was the very early stages of the investigation and did not yet know who was behind the pages. It said the creators had gone to greater lengths to hide their identities, 
than a Russia-based campaign to disrupt the 2016 presidential vote. It described attempts to erase election interference as an arms race. The Ghana Stock Exchange closing prices for trading session 784. Let's turn our attention to the Demar Harbour Bridge and the Barbies River Bridge schedules. And that's a wrap on today's broadcast. Before we go, here's a reminder of our top stories. New evidence surfaces in stabbing the death of a 15-year-old boy. Ghana gets a CDB funding for New Parika selling with Smart Bridge. And man who attempted to choke 5-year-old to death makes court appearance. Catch our rebroadcast at 23 hours today and at 6 hours 30 tomorrow. On behalf of our news and technical teams, I'm Sandy Ramutar, thanking you for watching. Have a good night.